Great, we are recording now. I'd like to welcome everybody joining us here live and everyone joining us via the recording for episode three of Awakening Beyond Thought. This is an online uh, interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. I just love saying that. Uh, hosted by Gary Weber and Richard Doyle. Very excited to have them both here with us today, sharing space together and sharing space with all of you. So we're going to get right into it. I'll introduce them very briefly. Professor Richard Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a liberal, liberal arts research professor at Penn State University, where he has taught since 1994. He has uh, been the author of several books. His latest is Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere, which focuses on the coevolution of humans with psychedelic plants such as psilocybin, cannabis, and ayahuasca. He was the host of our Penn State University collaboration, Radio Free Vallis, in which we investigated the works of Philip K. Dick, which was an amazing experience. And so we're grat greatly uh, excited to be doing this with him and his co-host, Gary Weber, who has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He's a PhD in physical science, sciences and has worked in military, national labs, industry and academia in R&D and in management. He's written several books, including Happiness Beyond Thought, Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening. And that's a lot of the inspiration for what we're doing here with him on this journey that he's having with Rich, helping us to learn exactly that. Uh, happiness beyond thought. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to both of these gentlemen and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Gary and I were thinking that maybe we should start with some questions, uh, although always there's plenty of things that will tumble out of our, ha uh, our mouths. But uh, if people have questions, we can start with those because it's really this sense of inquiry that we're trying to help foster uh, this this path has in my humble experience been an inquiry which is what makes it an ongoing adventure because you're always discovering you know new shit is always coming to light if I can quote the big Lebowski uh, and stuff is always kind of emerging and coming out and it's a participatory process so if people have those questions we want to encourage those questions Right, so if you guys want to use the chat there on the bottom, or depending on the view you have, you probably have it open as a separate window, you can chat the question to all participants, and we'll read it for you, or you can chat it just to me if you'd like to be anonymous about it, and I'll keep your name off it. And then while, while you're coming up with those um, questions, I'll, I'll tell you the story of uh, happiness beyond thought in a way, which is, that, you know, the way I met Gary, which I wrote about in, in, in the intro to the Awakening Beyond Thought uh, Bhagavad Gita verses was I was looking for somebody um, to help me learn Sanskrit. I, you know, from a scholarly perspective, thought I wanted to learn Sanskrit and, you know, was systematically looking for a teacher. And every time it looked like I was going to have a teacher who could teach me Sanskrit, it would fall through. And another one of these opportunities had just fallen through. I had lunch with a lovely man, but he no longer had facility for Sanskrit that he once had. So I was riding my bicycle home, and I saw this guy walking on the street. And I remembered that his name uh, was Gary, that he had worked with a few students of mine teaching them meditation. And I, I shouted to him, and he turned and, and looked, you know, as he always looks, kind of, you know, beaming. And um. I pulled over and I said, oh, you know, I read your book because I had uh, a student of his had handed it to me. And I said, it's all in the title, isn't it? And he said, yeah. And happiness beyond thought really is if you, if you don't take anything else away from, you know, what we're talking about or offering or sharing is that happiness is beyond thought. And that uh, we have this feeling that thoughts are our friends and that we can't make our way through the world without them, but whenever we inspect a moment of real suffering, as opposed to just pain, right, or as opposed to just bad event in the world, suffering, we can feel that that suffering, its main modality is actually the thinking that we're doing. It's the narratives, the stories we're spinning about what is happening. 
And this process is the process of being able to feel your way into the difference between the pain and the suffering or the events and the suffering as much as possible. And that way is happiness beyond thought. And beyond thought, there is happiness. We all know that happiness exists. We've all experienced happiness. And for some reason, it's difficult for us to accept that the way in which we can experience happiness is by learning to let go of thought. But that's what this process fundamentally is about. Yeah, another thing that comes up is, is a confusion <clears throat> is that people believe that if you have beyond thought is a dead brain. I mean, there's nothing going on. You can't possibly plan anything or work on any complicated problems in your, in your mind. Um, that's really incorrect. I and mean, that's a whole different brain circuit, the brain circuit that creates the problematic blah, blah, self-referential narrative that Rich was talking about is one network. And we know how to shut that down. We can shut down psychedelics temporarily. We can shut down with meditation for longer and longer times, but you can't shut down what is most people's internal life, which is this endless, painful narrative projecting the future, imagining the past, living the past, being sorry about the past, hoping tomorrow's going to be better, you can stop that. And the process, by stopping that, you can end up with a lot of excess, you know, now good bandwidth, higher signal noise ratios, less energy consumption, wasted, less wasted energy. And you can still uh, do all of your problem solving and planning as you, as you want to do. Uh, your scientists are still thinking you aren't encumbered in any way. You've just lost the problematic thoughts. Almost surgically carve those out and what you have now are the good ones that you can really do something worthwhile with. Even with more alacrity than before, you can really perform a much higher level. So we are given the bad ones, and we get to keep the good ones and even enhance their ability to function at a higher level. It's, it's really true. I mean, again, just to underscore what Gary's saying there, um, a correspondent of mine wrote me and said, well, you know, I'd really like to be, you know, get to the, happiness beyond thought but uh you know it's too anti-cognition i don't as no no that, that's not the case i love cognition i'm kind of a cognition junkie to be honest with you i i kind of got into all kinds of trouble with narrative thought because i'm a cognition junkie because i didn't make a distinction between the kinds of problem solving that gary is talking about and the endless spinning of narrative that involves an eye that is what bogs us down. And when you stop spinning all that narrative around the eye, right? When you that, then there's all these ideas that are flowing through you, and there's a kind of ecstatic capacity to go deeper into patterned thinking, deductive thinking, rational thinking, because there isn't this kind of recoiling be, before things that trouble your identity you know you don't want to go there with that kind of deduction and in fact and it just becomes pure thought in a way rather than this i dominated kind of what am i gonna how am i gonna keep secure my little story about the world which is most of our self-referential internal narrative you know that rich and i have made a video and i've got a blog post on this idea that you have to think to be able to speak and nothing for, could be further from the truth. I mean, you don't think up what you say. There's some really good research on this, recently done in Scandinavia. Uh, it doesn't isn't even true. If you just watch yourself as you speak with your friends, you don't sit there and premeditate every word that comes out of your mouth. I mean, it just comes out of no place, automatically, perfectly appropriate to the time at hand. Uh, so you don't need to have that narrative to run your life. If you watch carefully, you'll see it's just like two parallel tracks. You're talking. And something else is going on internally, blah, 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 but they're unrelated. They have nothing to do with each other. And the same thing going through your day, you have this narrative stream running in your brain thing. I have to have this to perform and function today. And in fact, you find that stream's about nothing that you're doing. It has nothing to do with the activities that you're doing, with walking, with moving around, eating, doing any of your functions. It has nothing to do with the narrative. The narrative is like a parallel universe, complete unto itself, unrelated to what's happening in the world. And it explains everything in terms of itself. It's the ultimate malware, really, is what it is. It's, you know, William S. Burroughs, the writer, once said, you know, language is a virus from outer space. 
I, I don't know about language actually, but the eye is certainly a virus that if you wither it, it feels like health. You know, it, it feels like that kind of freshness of, uh, of health that you have after you've been sick, where you realize like, ah, so this is what wellness feels like. That's what it feels like to dwindle the iPhone. So are there any questions, Jennifer? Yeah, we have a we have a bunch of questions coming in. <clears throat> so I'm I'm uh, gonna just start in with one that is uh, seems really related to exactly where you were just what you were just talking about. Um, David asks uh, when Gary writes that he only has a couple of thoughts per hour and they pass like birds high in the sky without landing. Is he only referring to self-referential thoughts? What about the flow of ideas like Rich mentions? Does this still happen for Gary? Well, for most of the day, I, I'm not solving problems. Uh, even when I write blog posts and stuff, there isn't a lot of thing going on. There isn't much processing going on. Sometimes when I'm writing, there's a kind of an interactive flow going back and forth between consciousness, blah, blah, where you can hear it, and offline. You may be trying to compose a poem or something, and you have put the question to offline consciousness, and it works on that, and it pops up sometime later, a possible solution to your problem, your rhyme in your poem. And you may say, no, that's not okay. And it goes back offline again. But the, the offline processor keeps running. Uh, and you can still just keep through your day. And really, there's nothing going on. The vast majority of my day, just, it's just quiet. Uh, when it comes time to, uh, to need to do something up there to plan, and it's not as often as you might think. I mean, we believe that we, have, we need to do a lot of uh, self-narration when we're planning something, but in fact, a lot of it is just addictive. You're so used to having this self referential narrative that you tend to drag it into situations where you don't even need it. But, you know, we'll, we'll allow for that since it's not usually problematic if you're just trying to decide how to get to the interstate. But you don't even need to narrate those. We often do, but they're not necessary. But yes, most of my day is just empty, still, peaceful, quiet, blissful. I mean, the brain does as we've written and talked about, does crank out dopamine, it likes this state, it doesn't like to be in confusion and chaos and anxiety and nervousness, depression, uh, it likes to be peaceful and still and ordered and efficient. And so it supports this with a lot of dopamine, probably some endogenous self-made opioids, the body can also make its own opioids. So uh, it just wants you to be in this, it wants to stay in this place, and it'll do what it can to keep you here, so there isn't a big uh, incentive to move out of it because you got it really is about as sweet a space as you can find. Yeah, I, I think uh, in, in my experience, the, the flow of ideas continues, but I, I'm i not really there to observe them. And so it's like Gary is saying, it's a, it happens offline. And then at a certain point, you're working on something, you go, oh, well, that would work. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of... Uh, you know, kind of, you know, pinching your brow together and working on it and thinking, I'm going to figure this out. The, the, the flow of ideas is happening, uh, you know, somewhere else, and there's, there's no real self there observing it. So the ideas just come into being, and that has a kind of really wonderful kind of signature to it. Where you're like, oh, you know, it's a kind of aha feeling where you weren't even thinking about that, but then a way of solving a problem or the line that's going to rhyme in the poem in Gary's example, et cetera, just pops, just happens, just manifests. So um, I, I wouldn't say that my entire day is uh, still, uh, but I would say that what's so interesting is that things pop up and then they kind of disappear very quickly, you know, like that little vortices of uh, self-referential, now what's happening occur. And then they're just kind of, they just, they're, all, they're funny, really. They, they, they become kind of moments of hilarity because there's a part of me that's watching Rich the dad, Rich the teacher, Rich the spouse, you know, all the different modes and then, you know, something's kicking up in one of those uh, uh, frameworks and some kind of a self-referential thought will occur. And then it just more or less kind of 
peters out, you know, things that would have um, gone into a spiral before. Just, just don't. Something else you can do is you can actually train your brain. The brain trains itself to do this on schedule. What I do is in the course of the day, I have some some problems that I'm working on, poems or something, or writing a blog post or some such thing. And there's not quite the right next phrase. And so you just, um, you know, let go of it. And what the brain's learned how to do is the next morning when I'm doing my morning routine, meditation routine, that in fact, up will come the answers. It's, it's kind of like the brain has learned for that first half hour in the morning. That's its time to come in, report back on the work that Curly and Will have been doing offline. And, uh, you know, me and the guys, if not with the answer, do you like it or not? And you get to say, yeah, that's a good good solution, Curly, and then we'll we'll go with this. So but the brain will do that. You can train it to do that. It learns how to do it itself. But it seems to gather the information all night long. First thing in the morning, it says, okay, here's a chance to go ahead and put up these answers and see what, what uh, if they're good or not. So you, you can you can surprising what the brain can learn how to do if you just get into the process and get the bad ones out of the way. You're uh, tune, as we're just saying, to a lot of things you didn't see before. A lot of creative solutions come up that you just hadn't paid attention to previously. They couldn't get up to the noise, or they were confused when they came up. But if it's very still, what you get are pretty much pure solutions and more creative ones. And if you look at the history of science, you see over and over again that, in fact, this takes place not among primarily people who are meditative practitioners and non-dual practitioners, but there's always the event where somebody goes away, or in fact, in the case of Barbara McClintock, a Nobel Prize winning biologist, she in fact would go off and meditate and let go and stop trying to figure it out. But you look back case study after case study, it's when people let it go and allow it to work offline that eventually the idea comes to them. So uh, cognition increases, suffering decreases, um, there's still some ideas that flow during the day for me, but they don't spiral off. Gary experiences more or less silence. Thank you for that. Uh, um, that was great answers, and I was just re reading the reply, or David says thank you for it, so thank you. I'm going to read. Do you, would you like some more questions? I've got lots of questions coming in. I don't know if you want to do yeah. that or keep it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Magdalena writes, um, I find myself really stressed by the whole beyond thought, getting rid of blah, blah, blah idea in the mm. way that it makes me think that I do not work properly, that I shouldn't be thinking, that my brain is working badly, etc. I know this is narrative thought again, but still, is there anything specific I could do about that, anything to start with? You could ask who's having that thought. I mean, really, you, you keep going back to the inquiry. This isn't meant to be a you know a torture system. It's meant to be, you know, trying to understand from Magdalena, what is this that's causing all this problem? Who's having this problem? Why is there this narrative that's concerned that it's not doing something correctly? And is it true? This is the old Byron Katie Sedona method approaches, which are in blog posts and they're online, lots of stuff online. Is this story true? That her brain, she's not running her brain properly. And how does she feel when she has that feeling? And if she didn't have that feeling, how would she feel? I mean, could she just let go of it? I mean, it's just the story she's telling herself, and the story may be completely false. And just asking simple inquiries like, who is it that has this confusion or this unhappiness about this not stopping thought? You can unwind a lot of it. And if that, that's too much, you know, just ask, when is Magdalena? Where is Magdalena? Um, and see if Magdalena is there all day long. You may find out that, in fact, there are many, many versions of her. And every time she meets somebody new, any of us meet somebody new, they see a very different person show up. A different ad hoc personality shows up for each meeting you have in the course of the day as the person changes. You'll see that, in fact, you know, there isn't one idea. There's a whole bunch of them. And you begin to parse them out and say, well, which is the one that's in charge here? There may be thousands of these. And how important can each one of these thousands be and who's in charge here? And you find, in fact, it's just a construct. It's just an intellectual construct that we developed 
as a species 75,000 years ago, basically an eye blink evolutionarily. And we've, you know, it was useful for a while, but it now it's become maladaptive. And as you can see, it's really consuming a lot of our bandwidth and causing us a lot of anxiety. You can be rid of that, not as a torture, but as a way to make you more efficient, happier, more at peace, more at ease. It doesn't take 10,000 hours to start feeling better. You can start feeling better very quickly. Just begin asking, where am I? When am I? And see what the answers are. And when the stress is happening, if, you know, as you're doing that inquiry, you know, think about how you would relate to another person that was stressing out about themselves not using their brain properly, right? You would, you know, th there's, there's a kind of, intentional love aspect here that you know you can get caught on but i found useful in my own path which is just like you know give yourself a break love yourself a little bit you know there's nothing wrong with you okay you you uh, are just having the experience of being on 21st century earth right and so uh you know instead of feeling like you're not good enough because you're having these thoughts you know take a breath Appreciate yourself, appreciate that you're noticing your thoughts at all. And do that inquiry that Gary is talking about. Who appreciates themselves? <laughs> Who is having a problem with themselves? When is Magdalena? Where is Magdalena? And so on. So sometimes if we feel too wound up to be able to get traction on the self-inquiry, then you know we need to have some self-compassion a little bit and just Give yourself some balm. Everything is okay. This is not a test. This is not a merit badge you have to get. This is not nothing wrong with you that this is happening. This is what's happening with everybody. And so if you can intentionally love yourself as you would love another, that can give you some space in order to do that self-inquiry. But without the self-inquiry, it's always going to come back. Otherwise, you'll just become really good at loving yourself and at loving other people. And you won't really unravel that eye from the inside like you need to yeah we, we really beat ourselves up worse than anybody beats us up right? we judge ourselves much much worse much more harshly than anybody else does i used to be co-leader at a local zen center and we did a thing called at the end of the day into the walking run ceremony after we did all the sitting was a voka samasta sukinu bhavantu which is I wish well-being to all the earth, all the things on the earth. And we do it first to, you know, all others. And we do it to people, we did it once for that, and then we did one repetition for people who were having difficulty with it at the time. And then the third repetition was really directed back on ourselves. So we said, lo ka samasta sukhini bhavantu, I wish well-being to myself, because we are the harshest critic that we will ever find, if anything, of ourselves. We just have to cut ourselves some slack because it gets in the way of letting go. I get a lot of people coming to me and saying, I feel so unworthy. And it's like, why do you feel unworthy? You are, are a child of the universe. Yeah. They take one of the take one of the key phrases. You have a right to be here. I mean, you're, you are here to get rid of your suffering and possibly help others get rid of their suffering. And so just give yourself some slack. We're not trying, no one's trying to punish you. Just stop punishing yourself. Hope that helps. Yeah, if you want to reply back to us, Magdalena, that would be great. Um, I have a question that's very similar, if I can kind of follow up with it. Um, it's, it almost ends up in the same place, but comes se almost seemingly from an opposite place. Uh, Ivan asks about self-inquiry and he says that lately it's become a sort of ego trap as the mind looks towards the inquiry as a way to feel better since I've already had experiences of the thoughts stopping. This turns inquiry into another ego seeking for the future and results in feelings of great anxiety and anticipation during inquiry. So he's, he's questioning the one who is anxious and seeking or is there some should he just question the one who is anxious and seeking, as you were saying, Gary, or is there some other approach? You both have touched upon that, but yeah. Just keep, just keep rolling back into it. I mean, the, the ego will endlessly try to find clever, clever and cunning ways to derail this process. It's a very cunning adversary. It doesn't want to lose its job as being CEO of you. 
And so if, you, if this starts to go deeper and deeper and make some serious incursions into the belief in this eye as being the avatar that should run the place, and you begin looking carefully, <clears throat> the brain sees. And in fact, eh, this thing might not work so well. So just keep going back. If something comes in and says, oh, this is really a bad practice. We need to stop this thing right away. Just ask, who, what is it that's saying that? What is this entity that's coming in and saying, oh, this is a bad thing. We should, we should go off and, you know, go on YouTube for seven hours or watch four hours of Facebook. Uh, just ask who it is that has that problem. Just inquire back into that and try to feel what this thing is that's asking this, oh, we just need to get back more time on YouTube. We've really solved this problem. I can look at another four hours of videos. That's all I need to do. And you find out in the four hours, nothing has changed. All you've done is let this egoic structure deflect the process for four hours. So if it, something comes in and tells you it's not okay, just ask, who is it that's having this problem? Yeah, the, the content doesn't matter so much if you keep going with the same process. Um, and, you know, this idea that, you know, you're just going to become really good at self-inquiry, you know, it's, it's like the ego trying to bust itself almost, it sounds like, saying, oh, well, you're just really proud of being good at self-inquiry, <laughs> which would be fine, actually. Just keep doing self-inquiry, because as you get good at self-inquiry, the self goes away. So there's no problem with becoming good at self-inquiry and getting that good feeling from self-inquiry. That's, in fact, the goal, was the good feeling. Yeah, and, and, mm. and pe people sometimes get this, almost always, quickly ask a question, like, where am I? And there's a very short pause there. That's the answer. There is no you. You can't find where you are. You're any place. You don't exist. That's, you know, neuroscientifically, that's the answer, and that's the answer oh. experientially. There's just, there's just nothing there. And quickly, then the ego comes in and fills in. Here's an answer. How about this answer? And just as you keep doing self-inquiry, keep watching that space after you ask the question. It's a re that's the real space. And just let that expand. Let it get larger and larger and see what happens. See if, in fact, the brain doesn't find that it likes that and keeps wanting to come back to it. It's not a bad thing to want to come back to self-inquiry. The problem really is if you try to find some way to avoid doing it so you don't have to... No. Go after the eye. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, if you want to reply in the chat, um, Magdalena said thank you, and, and Ivan is also saying thanks for the answer. I can relate to watching YouTube for four hours. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So <laughs> can I. Um, <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, thank you guys for that. Uh, I have um, Lindsay is ready with a question here, and I, I just don't know if she stepped away with her baby, so I'm going to unmute her really quickly. Lindsay, are you still there? Okay, no, I don't think she is right now so we'll we'll come back to her Matthew I'm gonna unmute you and you can ask your question Matthew okay great can you hear me yes yeah. thank you okay um thanks Gary and Rich um my question let me try to flesh this out here is um it kind of has to do with uh like in the inquiry practice especially during like a formal meditation type of context when I'm doing the practice I get stuck up with like the uh, like the like trying to kind of objectify the sense of I. Um, and that's kind of where I get snagged. Like when I'm doing the practice, um, you know, it'll get to a point where, and I, I know like Ramana and everything we'll talk about, just like hold on to the sense of uh, of self, of sense of I. And when I'm doing that, you know, obviously if, if I'm creating it into an object that I can hold on to, it's, it's not the real sense of I. And then I know like the, you know, normally like the kind of the set answer for this would be, you know, it's not something you can know, obviously, because it's something that can't be objectified. So you just have to be it. And when it comes to just having to be it, that's where, like, experientially, I can't, I have trouble, like, kind of vibing with what that would mean exactly. Um, and, like, well, you know, if I, if, if I uh, fall back from my effort in the inquiry, then, like, I can fall back into the blah, blah, blah type of situation. But then if I, if I, um, uh, if I keep up, you know, with the effort, with the inquiry, then it kind of gets into that same dynamic of where I'm trying to objectify this, this sense of self. And I mean, overall, my, my, the inquiry does, does go well. And I have noticed like a settling of the thoughts and everything. I just, I don't know if this question even makes sense really, but I'm just, this, I kind of get snagged up on this issue of like objectifying the sense of self and how that can't be, you know, I hear Gary says a lot, you know, it, it, you know, if, if it can be objectified, then it can't be who you are. 
But then it's almost like my ego or my mind or whatever can't imagine how you couldn't objectify something and then still know it. You know, I guess that's kind of the issue. Okay. Well, what, when, when you when you turn around and you get to the place to where you turn, look, and try to objectify the eye, you know, we've done this. We made the, the meditations on YouTube. I've got four of them. They all basically go to the same place where you position yourself on the bank of the river or something, and you see your stream of thoughts going by, your sensations, breath, etc., go by, and you can feel yourself as a subject on the bank, looking at all these objects, and you clearly aren't those objects. And then we say, okay, go out into the stream, and then turn around and look back at what it is just looking out at the stream. And that's the objectifying of the subject. But it, obviously, as you correctly point out, you have turned around now, and you've become now a new subject, looking back at the old subject. Right. So you're back, back in the subject again, and the best the best way I found to get around, get through this thing, is to get a feel for it. It really becomes very tactile. I mean, you can feel when you've got a, a condensation in consciousness that is forming something different from just pure consciousness. If you look at the, the pure spaces, there's a pure energy to that. And as soon as you come in with a subject of any kind, either trying to objectify the subject or objectify your breath or watch your emotions and sensations or stories, you can feel that energy change in your consciousness. You can feel something pulled together that isn't of the same quality as the base consciousness. There's something there that feels very different, not better. It's like, ooh, uh, and that's the eye remanifested. So you can then be very present and watch that thing remanifest. And if you're totally present in that still space, you see this thing remanifest. If you're really totally present for it, you can see it will just start to manifest like a bubble on a lake, and it will just go back down again. It will go back down to the stillness. And you just you can be in that stillness and be very present and watch these things begin to bubble up. But even if you're trying to objectify a subject and you find yourself a subject as a subject, an object as a subject. Just keep feeling for that space. Keep feeling what happens in consciousness when you do your observations. If you objectify everything, feel what that subject feels like. If you turn back and look at it, feel who's looking back at it. This is really a tactile sense, sense of thing. It's not something you have mentally going on. You've got to get a feel for it because it does feel differently if you begin trying to form a subject to look at the previous subject. I, I would even encourage you to to let go of the language of object, objectifying it and really um, just follow, you know, look for where these thoughts are coming from. You know, my my daughter who's eight years old is going through probably a developmental thing where children want to stop believing in magic. And... Uh, so she said, I don't believe in magic. And I said, oh, uh, I said, really, where do your thoughts come from? <laughs> <laughs> and she paused <laughs> and not knowing that there was no way of looking, looked. And she said, yeah, where do they come from? <laughs> you know? and, 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 and so I think sometimes we use different language models and then we get good with those language models and they trip us up a little bit. So that's why Gary's saying, I think the feeling and the tactile part is, don't even try to objectify it. Just look back and see who's looking. You know, just feel who's looking, who's having the idea, where's that idea coming from, and then maybe some of that script of the kind of objectivization will fall away. Yeah, Rich has got that's a, that's a good point. We had a meditation we called the Heisenberg Meditation. I don't know if you were, who Werner Heisenberg was, but he was part of one of the good people in quantum physics. His principle was you can't fix both position and momentum for anything. You can fix one or the other, but not both. And so we had this, uh, basically comes from one of the physics people, but this idea of if you can look very carefully, as Violet has done, both the Violet meditation now, and look and see where your thoughts come from. If you can get, this is basically the same bubble in the lake store. If you keep watching very carefully, try to catch your next thought as it comes in. See if you can get your way to the front of your thoughts and be present for the arising of the next thought. And just see if, in fact, do you think up your thoughts? As asked. Uh, and, and can you be there for their emergence? You can actually, if it's not easy, you can work yourself to the very front end of your thoughts. If one skip by, let it go by. Keep going back to the front end of your thoughts and try to see if you can catch them as they emerge. 
and just see what happens. And just see if, in fact, you know, as you don't think up your thoughts, can you just stop them that way? And what's great about that is, is that what it takes to get to the place where you're watching the thoughts emerge is just quite simply stillness. You're stilling yourself down enough to just feel it. And so that can, I think, probably um, help with probably what's coming in with the cognition. But, you know, these are the kind of things that happen along the way. So can I just like a really quick follow up to that? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, just um, in terms of what you're saying, that was really helpful. Thank you. Is um, do you think? I know. I think sometimes my inquiry just gets a little too mental, you know, a little too on the mental level, and then like um, kind of along these same lines, I was wondering, you know, because I hear some teachers and some people say that to just more of like the sit and do nothing type of approach, where where you with the meditation, you just let everything be, like let the thoughts go, let everything be, and just like settle and let everything settle down. Um, do you think for me, maybe kind of mixing those two to a certain degree that maybe there's too many of the questions, too many of the, in, too much, the inquiry is too forceful or something? I, I, I haven't found that that works. And I, I've, I have to, the Zen Center I taught is mostly a Soto Zen Center. I do Rinzai, there's no difference. But Soto, you basically do what Vipassana is or mindfulness meditation. You're just present, you're just watching what's going on. The problem is you have no way to disabuse yourself of the majority structure. And what happens with a lot of people I know who've been come to me and they've been doing the Boston for 20 years is they say, it doesn't get any better. I just keep sitting here and watching it over and over again. Nothing's happening. And, that's the, and the problem is you don't ever, you know, you, you actually create a mega ego. You become a, a meditative ego master of doing the Boston. You have this enormous egoic structure that grows over time over 20 years that look how fantastically I can sit here and observe my consciousness. But in fact, you've gotten no way to disabuse yourself of that egoic structure, which is why many of those people, that's, that's, that's too simple, some of these people get into dark night of the soul because they've been doing this process sometimes uh, very aggressively for a long time. And if they aren't careful, you can get this big ego and it gets starts to break down, but there's no way to understand what's happening to it. And so you get this dark night of the soul experience, which is St. John of the Cross, very painful for some people, unless they've done some self-inquiry, unless they really question the nature of that I earlier and tried to start breaking down this I and ask, where am I or when am I or what is this I? Unless you deconstructed that somehow, then you've got a very big ego there with a lot of meditative power behind it. It can be a very uh, unhappy experience. Very painful experience. So even people get into dark night of the soul, uh, one of the protocols they use now is to go into self-inquiry, to you know begin trying to deconstruct. But you're already you've already got the problem. If you can get in front of that and just begin doing some self-inquiry ahead of time, you'll have a device, a tool, to be able to keep that from happening because you have de-energized that egoic structure. If not, you could be in for a very rough ride. Okay. And Matthew, I would say it sounds like what it feels like from here is that if it's becoming very mental, you may think about the distinction between observation and thought. In other words, to observe something does not require mentation in the usual sense. Now, granted, we're asking you to observe thought, so it's kind of interception, introspection, but if you can feel what the difference is between observing something and thinking something, then you may be able to catch yourself, you know, mentalizing it too much. Because remember, what you want to do is you want to observe where this I is, when this I is, who this I is. You don't want to just ask and get an answer. You want to observe. And it's really like observing a tree or a bird or a waterfall or anything else. You're just observing. So feeling that difference between mentation and observation might be helpful for you there. Yeah, and that's great. And to that point, it's really, this is a, a curiosity. It's a, it should be an interesting journey to mm. take. This is not meant to be a you know some kind of flagellation. And what we're trying to do here is say, with a lot of curiosity, I mean, what is this I? 
Is it a real thing? Where does it live? How does it function? What is its purpose? Is it useful or not useful? Just be very curious about it. And the rich is saying, you know, develop that sense of curiosity and energy and feeling for what's going on and try to step out of your head. Because if you go into your head, there's nothing good coming out of that. Uh, when we express it. So get tactile with it and get real with trying to sense and feel what you're doing and feel if the eye's real or not. Or is it just something that the, you can just watch the brain create and then let go of? It really is just like, you know, watching a bird in a tree, too. You know, you're just watching it. You know, there's no even need to identify. It. And, and as Gary was saying, it's really exciting because because most of us have spent the vast majority of our lives not looking back at who we are, there's an adventure. That, I mean, it's, it's fascinating because, as I said before, you know, a couple, about a half hour ago, stuff comes up. And then you see it, you go, oh, my gosh, what is that? Right? And then you say, who's having this question? So it, it's as exciting as at least as exciting as the external world to explore it. And as you explore it, it becomes more and more transparent and more and more lucid. And so uh, it, it's quite joyful. Yeah, it, it gets to be more fun. I mean, the, the, yeah. the stiller it gets and the more discreet your thoughts get and the more spaced out they are and the less energetic they are, the more you can really take great pleasure yeah. in doing the process because you can't, you know, the brain is very parsimonious. It wants to save real estate. It will go around and look at all the brain maps and say, well, there's an area that's not being used. There's an unoccupied building over there. And we'll go over and haul that building up into consciousness and say, look, do you still care about this building? <laughs> and you say, what? What building? That building is still there? That building has still has been standing there for 30 years. We haven't. I wouldn't even it. squat in that building. We haven't even used that building. Why are we still have that building around? And so my brain says, do you care about this? No. Liquidate. Don't care about it. brain says, okay, we're tearing it down. So the brain tears it down, gets it out of there, and repurposes it. And so you'll find this the old, old buildings popping up all across consciousness over this time goes along and you just with delight watch them manifest the brain is trying to clean out all the old neural networks that are all tied up and still locked up and not being used and turns out they're not even useful buildings anymore and you can just let go of them and you feel them release yeah you can actually get some dopamine yeah just having the release you feel the release and that's why it's fun right because <laughs> You go, ooh, another one I get to release. And it cracks you up because I've had them, you know, from 44 years ago. And there's a thought that I had to not take delivery on, let go of, and go, oh, that cracks me up. I've been carrying that around with me. Hilarious, right? It's really good fun. So enjoy it. Great. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your question. Uh, we have another question here. If you guys still want to take some more, or you uh, want uh, to talk about something else, yeah. Yeah. you're good. Take yeah. some more. Okay, cool. Okay, Erica, I'm going to unmute you. Erica, you're on. Day, gentlemen. Hello. Blessings. Uh, I got a question about what does your nothing look like. Uh, I love the feeling and I'm a Pisces. I can kind of get there pretty good. Like I can put my thoughts become kind of background, you know, and uh, you know, there's, there's background noises around. So it kind of goes background, but then I'm feeling very peaceful and I love that joy uh, of nothing. <laughs> and then I'm looking though, I've still got this visual. I'm, and uh, I try to shut off my eyes and just see with my third eye. But then I'm like, okay, Shell, what is there something I could, that I could focus on? Like, is there a light? Am I meant to like visualize what's the nothing look like? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, when. Uh, I received some instruction uh, from ayahuasca many years ago. There was this, this more or less came up. And uh, 
And the interesting thing is, is that in, from my own experience, whenever you're seeing something, you need to look to whence that something emerges. And when you look to whence that something emerges, that is what you're looking for. <laughs> and so it doesn't really uh, look like anything other than everything. Um, and so I would say as long as there is an image, then you want to look to see what is projecting that image. Because what I've always found is that the images themselves can snare our attention. And then there's a self looking at an image. Whereas the way to avoid having your attention snared by the image is to ask whence the image is emerging and who's having the vision. When you do that, it seems to me something else, something else happens where there isn't really so much an answer of what does the nothing look like as there is that there is the experience of no self. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. It's something else I'd, I'd uh, look for. The reason we go, we focus on self referential narrative thoughts. One is they're problematic. They cause all kinds of problems and anxiety, but they also are sure indicators that there's still an I, me, my hanging around. And so when you say, you know, I've got this great experience, I've got this great bliss and everything, but off in the corner, this is Michelle, right? Michelle? It's Erica. Erica, Eric, I'm sorry, Eric. There's a, off in the corner, there's an Erica saying, oh, what's going on over there? What's happening? <laughs> we should be doing something more. And so, you know, this Erica that's off in the corner, whispering and mumbling to herself, is the one you want to, you want to focus on. I mean, don't uh, be too, too attracted by this whole, this is really a sweet space when I hang out in here, because she's over there in the corner murmuring, she's not gone. And so you can try to re-engage Erica, one of the Erica's over there, and the techniques we talked about before, like when am I, or you know, when is Erica? Is it is the same Erica show up for every time she meets somebody? Or are there many Erica's, hundreds, thousands of Erica's? And if there are, then you can begin to look and say, well, there's a thousand Erica's, Who's in charge here? And just, you know, keep working with that process and try to say, okay, who's a Pisces? I mean, just feel your way back into who's a Pisces. I don't, I'm not picking on astrology, but just feel back into who it is that is a Pisces. And say, so what is this Erica who owns this Pisces? Mm -hmm. And feel your way back into her. Not to push anything away, but just say, well, okay, who's, who is the Pisces? Where is she? When is she a Pisces? All the time, and just keep looking back at any identification that you come forward with, whether it's in bliss or not in bliss. You just keep feeling you know, where, when, why, what is this area? Okay, that really helps. Well, yeah, like someone who surrenders, or that's yeah. really great. Yeah, but can you just tell me, guys, what do you see? <laughs> No, no, they're, 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 it's all like asking, you know, what, what's a rose smell like? <laughs> I mean, people have been trying for, you know, thousands of years to somehow accurately capture the, the ineffable. But it's yeah. like saying, you know, what, what does it, you know, what does green tea taste like? Or what does a rose smell like? We can babble on forever about this thing and take all kinds of metaphors for it, but you're still left with a transcendental experience by its very nature, that there's really nothing you can describe it. I mean, to me, uh, it, it, is, it is amazingly sweet. I mean, to me, it's better than my best orgasms, not to get profane, but it's really a very sweet, powerful, deep stillness. I mean, it is really a, a unique space that the brain has created for itself out of its own chemicals. Mm. It's where I've been trying to go without knowing it all my life. And mm -hmm. that is recognizable in it. Mm -hmm. But trying to translate it as it's being, you know, I mean, I hope that helps. And, and, and Kisab, uh, we did a very uh, an informal, casual uh, survey. And I had people I worked with for some time 
who were experiencing psychedelics. I'm a complete version of psychedelics, so I'm, I'm, I'm no good source there. Psychedelics, sex, and this non-dual state. And people have had a you know, persistent experience. And I said, you know, rank these things up on a relative one to ten scale between sex, drugs, and non-duality. And you know what, how it came out was, you know, sex came in like an eight, psychedelics like nine something. But this non-dual experience actually had a higher relative pleasure ranking than sex and drugs. And so it's, you know, that helps to position it for you. It's 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 a much better version with not the downsides of sex and drugs. I mean, it really, there isn't much downside to it at all. It's self-generated, it's not illegal. Uh, you all, we all have one. And so there's no problem there. It's just, you know, trying to visualize it that way. Think of it as a high pleasure experience with almost with virtually no pain and no historical downside. <laughs> Thank you. you. You remember Spinal Tap, the, 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 the amp that goes to 11? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Love duality is 11. <laughs> so it's everything and nothing and everything yes, you yeah. hope for is... is but, but it's not nothing. It's yeah. really yeah. far beyond nothing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank okay. you. It's a Thanks, great Erica. Time. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for that. Um, Lindsay, I'm going to unmute you now. Uh, take a question from Lindsay. You're all set. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep, yeah. can hear you. Yeah, that's Hello, it. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, good afternoon. Good morning, Hello. wherever you are. Um, so I just uh, don't really have a question per se, more of an observation mm. um, that I've kind of just been experiencing with uh, being new to parenthood. And um, I recall um, an old video you guys did um, where you discussed how your children can be you know, your greatest masters and your greatest mm -hmm. teachers um, because they can point out, the, you know, push your buttons and point out the things to you that you didn't know were there. Um, so one thing that I had experienced, which um, I don't really know what to call it, caveman, primal, monkey mind or something like that. But it was um, one one time, um, you know, my, my son's crying, 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 and I'm trying to change his diaper and he, you know, just moving all around and just being a, a complete mess and this like, oh, I have to go. He's, um, he's crying. <laughs> but quickly it was just, um, it was like I had done a raspberry to his face and it was like, like this really primal thing coming out and it wasn't anything I identified with. Um, but it's like, it was like this deep, uh, primal thing that came out that, um, it was, something that I was not aware of and I have gone through experiences of ridding myself of the ego and such, but this was something that um, was primal and didn't really feel of me, but more something coming from my DNA. So that's my question. Uh, there's no question that being a parent is conducive to ego death. <laughs> In practice, uh, it's often not because uh, People think that they know what they're doing, and so they don't um, learn how to let go of this idea that they know what they're doing. Uh, but if you continue to surrender, then the biological aspect of yourself will continue to teach you how to take care of your child. No question about that. Um, we have a blank screen now, uh, Jennifer, is there? Uh, I think Lindsay shut her camera off oh, real quick. Okay. So I, I, I'm just gonna assume that she might've stepped away a little bit yeah. there to uh, take care of her baby. But but yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, Next question. Cool, yeah, we have, we have another question here. I can read it and then Lindsay, if you wanna just chat anything to let us know if you're back. Um, but I have Jake asking, uh, how do thoughts influence the movement of the body? It's like perfectly timed mm. for what you just said. For mm. example, if I have the thought I should turn off the tea kettle and then the body moves to turn off the tea kettle, does this count as a self-referential thought or would the body move to turn the kettle off without this thought? Thanks. Yes. <laughs> yes, Jake. The last part. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, if you have no narrative going on inside, you'll be surprised that in fact, you know, you find yourself walking over to the tea kettle and picking it up. And then you find yourself walking over to pick up the tea and get it out. You don't have to narrate it. I mean, you just imagine, because we're so used to narrating what's going on around us, 
that in fact we believe we cause it. That you know all the carbon neuroscience we have in the mountains of it uh, says that your your motor cortex is running the whole thing anyway. The motor central cortex is just going to move you around from place to place uh, with or without narrative. The narrative has nothing to do with whether or not you pick up the tea kettle or not. I mean, motor cortex and central cortex have already cooked it up and they're going in and doing it. So it, it, you don't really pick up any of those things. It just appears like you do, but you really don't. Yeah, this, in fact, your thought that you're going to go pick up the tea kettle is a latecomer to the whole process, right? That it's an epiphenomenon to the whole process. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking with Matthew and talking about how much fun this is, part of the fun can be, you know, when you get into, you know, periods where you're just observing how the body bodies and the world worlds for very long periods of time. And it's very hilarious because everything is just kind of happening. And there isn't this kind of narrative of I need to go, you know, pick up the tea kettle or I need to even go pick up the kids or I need to go and change the diaper. The diaper just gets changed. The kid gets picked up. The car gets driven. All the things get done because the being that thought that it was in charge before and was telling the story of reality and how important it was was never doing it anyway. It was just talking about doing it. You know, it was just uh, taking credit for doing it. That's why I talked about it as malware. It's like really a, you know, basically it's a parasite um, that that likes to hitchhike on top of all these other processes and then take credit for them. Whereas once you sort of start to let go of uh, that, that I that's taking credit for all the processes, it's really amazing because you just watch and everything occurs. You know? Yeah, but people come to me and say, well, what if I don't think, am I going to never get out of bed in the morning? I said, well, <laughs> we'll try it. Just lay in bed in the morning. Just lay in bed and see what happens. Just don't think, don't move, just stay in bed and see what happens. And they go, well, so what happened? He said, well, I just found myself getting up and putting on my pajamas or all my pajamas and going in and doing this. Your body just does what it's going to do. You don't have to talk about it, narrate it, think about it. It just does it all by itself. Just get out of the way. Yeah, in fact, if anything will make you stay in bed in the morning, it's thought. Because, <laughs> you know, you're, the, the, the kind of impossible, overwhelming nature of the day as you try to figure it out through the little eye construct is going to keep you in bed. But if you just let go and let it unfold, then everything takes care of itself and the tea kettle gets picked up. Good question, Jacob. Jacob. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jake. And uh, if you have any comments you'd like to make in the, the chat, that would be great. Um, I have one from Sean here. And I mean, also if Lindsay just uh, wanted to clarify that her question was more about the primal mind and it not being self-referential, but more coming out of while being in observational mode. And she asks, who is this monkey mind? Not me and not even the self I pre previously identified with. So no, uh, that's kind of otherness to your own mind. Um, yeah, so I have a, a, another question here uh, from Sean. I just want to, if you guys are still open to a few more here, they're coming in and uh, lots of questions, which is great if you guys are still open to taking a few more. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, or I didn't want to cut you off from anything. Well, um, no. Oh, great. Sean asks, is there still a sense of effort, emotional, physical, mental, in your experience, whether identified with or not? Uh, I, I, do, I mean, I, I have, as near as I can ascertain, completely let go of any misconception I'm in charge of anything. And, and I've, I've done that because I, I, I can see that I'm not in charge. But even logically, I can see that, that if I'm there, it, it's a lot worse than if I'm not there. If I just let go, then somehow something, call it the universe, call it, you know, universal consciousness, the universal field, whatever, Something is arranging things so much better than I could ever arrange them. It's very easy to surrender and let, I call it her, let her do it. Because, I mean, I, I've had so many serendipities, uh, propitious events, and precognitions in the last years that I, I just have no delusion about my need to effort anything. She just arranges things so much more rich. I've had so many serendipitous experiences it will meet someplace unexpectedly fantastic things happen out of that that you just couldn't arrange by yourself you just couldn't imagine 
This is not me and me, but I know five billionaires. I'm just a kid from the coal country of Western Pennsylvania. I could never have even imagined how to ever talk to these people, let alone meet them and be friends with them. It just happens. I mean, you just get out of the way and let the universe do what she really knows how to do best. If we are her agents of evolution and she's evolving herself through us, then all we need to do is just let go and be fully present in the moment, totally 100%, and that's your job, is to be fully present. And then just let her do the dance for you. You just part of the dance. You're just a sock puppet in the dance. And it's beautiful. And indeed, it, it feels like the universe is testing to see if indeed you are totally fully present. So uh, the episodes of effort that I do have periodically, the suffering is immense. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I don't, I, I teach, you know, college level classes, two to, two to three of them a semester. There is no effort, okay? Uh, I cook dinner and meals for my family every other day. There is no effort. Um, every now and then something will pop up and there is effort. You know, there's an attempt to kind of like solve it or manage it, manage it in some way. And it feels so bad that it is like a kind of immediate pointer to self-inquiry. Self-inquiry is done. It mitigates and it's very funny. Right, because the, the you see how unnecessary this sense of effort and suffering is. And Richard, Richard is a masterful teacher. I, not because I'm here, I'm, I'm patronizing him. He's really a skillful teacher, and it's fascinating to watch how he teaches some, some very difficult, controversial subjects like you know, the Bible from a non-dual perspective, which is a magnificent course. But it's so much of it is serendipitous and just manifests that day as it manifests exactly perfect for that class at that time as they are there it's just a beautiful thing to watch he just lets he's just not there and the fantastic class comes out of him cosmos just wants to unfold you let it <laughs> so awesome yeah we experienced a little bit of that magic on online or a lot of that magic actually when we did the philip k dick course with, with rich so those of you who are on for that know full well what gary's talking about so um that's awesome and sean says thank you in the chat and um i i have another question here um from ivan and he asks, can emotions be questioned the same way as self-referential thoughts, or do they need to be felt and let go of? Also, can emotions arise without any seemingly conscious thought, or are they simply subconscious? Thank you. Yeah, you can, you know, who has this fear? Who has this anger? Who has this uh, anxiety? You can, I mean, there's a source for those emotions. Uh, they're, they're coming out of something. If you, you can go into them. I mean, the big thing about emotions like fear is welcome them in and have them in for tea. If there's a you know you're enraged and you're furious about something and really angry in the moment it may be difficult to catch it. But if you can just be present for it and let it come in, let it be there and dance fully, and then feel your way into the texture and structure, especially fears. You can feel your way into the fear, let it come into you, however horrible it might seem. Just go into it and see what's there. What's inside the fear? What color is the fear? What shape is it? Is it even a concrete thing? Or is it just some fantasm? If you find structure, then see if you can let go of this fear. Is this fear useful to you anymore? It may be a fear from decades ago. It may be of no value whatsoever. And you can just by saying, I'm going to let go of this thing. Amazingly, this is now you in psychotherapy. Amazingly, you can let go of it. There's not some stone tablet someplace that says you have to keep this fear around forever. If you don't want it there, you can let go of it. And it can be good practice to practice this uh, questioning who's having an emotion uh, around positive emotions as well, because it's easier, right, at first. And you might think, oh, I'm going to step on my good feelings, but you don't actually. Like, it actually allows you to expand. Uh, the, the, the emotions themselves become expansive and it gets you into the habit of who's having this emotion, who's having this emotion so that when the anger or the fear 
uh, or the sorrow or any of the negative emotions come up, then you kind of have that as a practice and it's, it's not like something you're trying to make up, you know, at the last minute you have it as a practice, you can do it. You can very quickly get to the fact that there's nobody there having that uh, emotion. And so it just kind of dissipates. That's an excellent point. Yeah. If you can, you know, like go and lifting the weights, lift the little weights first, you know, the positive emotions say, who's having this, this joy, and this happiness, and this pleasure. And, then you condition yourself to that process. You know how to do the process when it becomes much more difficult, like when you're angry or you're just terrified. To just walk into that cold turkey is very difficult. If you've done the practice a lot, you've done it many times, you know how the protocol goes. And if you really do it a lot, like the Sedona technique or the Byron Katie stuff, it becomes a heuristic. I mean, the brain actually recognizes when some sort of emotion comes on the scene if it's above a certain level, the brain will just invoke this little simple process. It will be one of those two approaches. And Zippo, the thing will disappear before you can hardly even recognize it. The brain likes to do that. It knows how to do it. It doesn't need you to tell it what to do after a while. It's figured out it all out. It loves to do it. Zip, magic laser is gone. But you have to practice it ahead of time, like Rich was saying. Go with the easy ones first, and then work with them. Learn the process so it's there for when you have to have it. It's just a tool that you can work with the tool, get it ready for when you're really going to have to use it. Beautiful. Thank you. Ivan says, thank you for the answer. Um, we had a similar question coming up about working with anger, and you answered it in the process of answering this question, which is great, about like starting with the lighter emotions or, or what we think of as the easier emotions. So, um, Wonderful. So I have a question here from Jake, and maybe that will take us uh, to a kind of summary, or, or I don't know, but we still have some time here. So it's, it's been great questions, guys. Um, do you find that there is a thought behind every emotion? Yeah, there are very few that are not. I mean, if, if, if you go into them, it, it's, it's, an, it's, you know, it's an exploration for you, Jake, I mean, to just keep, see if you can find an emotion that doesn't have a thought behind it. It is an uncaused pure emotion. Now, you, you do have limbic reactions. I mean, there is limbic anger, there is limbic fear. You don't, I don't step off of uh, cliffs, I don't jump in front of buses, I don't grab boys in the snakes and shake them in my face. Anymore. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, but, but there are inculcated, evolutionarily, Darwinianly encoded fears that we have self protective with. Thank goodness we don't lose those. I mean, they are there. They're pure emotions. Some of your angers can be very pure. I mean, getting cut off in traffic, if you watch it very carefully, it happens so fast you can't uh, stop it. You can't get in front of it. It's really like a 15, 20 millisecond thing. You just can't process it fast enough to do anything thinking about it. It's just there. And those were developed for us over millions of years. So you can't stop those. But the... Uh, mentated process fears once you come in and begin having stories about it. Like, that guy cut me off. Who's he think he is anyway? Yeah. And we get back, where's my gun? Where's my gun? This guy, this is the third guy cut me off this week. This is not going to happen to me again. I will hunt Who used him. up all my ammo? I will hunt him down. You know, that's the part of these emotions that you can cut off. If you have the first fear, it may be an actual real fear. If you're caught up in traffic, it may be a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. You realize that very quickly. You can't stop it. You can't get in front of it. So you say, okay, then just don't go into the follow-on discussion discourse about it. So yes, there are some, but just don't worry about the ones that are uh, Darwinianly encoded. Worry about the story afterwards, which is really where the problem comes in. Exactly. I mean, and and you know, apropos the biological imperatives of parenting, this is where I, you know, if, if somebody somehow in some perceived way endangers, like get, gets between me and my children in some kind of a situation or it's so fast, it's, there's, there's no getting, but, but there's, it also just dissipates immediately. There isn't the kind of like, well, you know, I can't believe society is like this or something. There's just, shoo, shoo, you know, and, uh, you know, it's actually quite liberating because you know that you're there. If you if you need to be there, say, to protect your children as best as you can, 
you're there. There's nothing that you can do about it story-wise, narrative-wise to be there. And you will be in action. But the other stuff, it's just all, you know, again, that parasitic eye trying to, trying to take credit. Boy, what I would have done with him, you know, kind of uh, talk. And, and, and that's all the toxic stuff. So um, there is, there does seem to be some feeling without an I thought that is behind all feelings. But then we're getting back into the Erica question of what that feeling is. But there's, there's something there, you know, that in the title, I, you know, I wrote the word radiance, but there's, there's something very beautiful and even effervescent there that is, Something like a feeling, but it's not, um, it's con the condition of feeling it is to not have that self-referential narrative going. Well, now I know. I want to know what to call it. I feel like it might be desire or something, but I don't know. Well, mm. think, think, think more like bliss. Mm. Such a Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm, uh, I think we're out okay. of questions, which, uh, and Jake says thank you. Thank you, Jake. An answer. Okay. Thank you, Jake, for the Thanks question. To everybody. Um, if you guys want to uh, talk for a little bit or take us to a summary or whatever summary sounds like a weird word, I'll just be quiet and let you guys do what you want to do. <laughs> well, I wanted to return to this word happiness, you know, because uh, and we probably have to, you know, clarify a bit, but a lot of times people get hung up like they're like I need to be enlightened or I want to be enlightened or I need to wake up and so forth and really this is where we're all what we're all trying to experience I think we can inquire into our own experience and know that we all are trying to be happy and we can all notice that that there's the kind of happiness that lasts incredibly transient right so the happiness of the first bite of the chocolate bar and then the transience of the happiness once we are finished with the fifth chocolate bar or whatever, that it comes and goes. It does not, it's not really what we're looking for. Otherwise we wouldn't have another one. But what we're trying to get to there is an experience of happiness that does exist. It's not like we have to go on faith and think like, well, you know, is there a God, you know, or do I have to trust that somebody else has been enlightened? We can look in our own life and know that we can experience happiness for no good reason. It's not happiness tied to some material event or product or circumstance. It's just happy for no good reason. And to me, that is the quarry that we can help remind ourselves of when we get all bound up in kind of thinking like becoming enlightened or becoming awakened or that we're on a, a a religious path or any of these things. It's really quite simple. It's what our body and our brain is trying to find in the first place, which is that happiness. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And to, just to conclude, to follow up on that, I almost called my first book Uncaused Happiness. But I thought it would be so confusing to people. It wouldn't work. And I tried on some uh, work with this. Uh, so I didn't use uncaused happiness. That's really what we're after. I mean, happiness that doesn't have a cause. I mean, it is already in you know, within us to have uncaused happiness with no end to it, no precognition, no, 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 no predisposition to it, nothing. It's just there. We can be happiness without a cause. We don't need a stimulus. We don't need a partner. We don't need anything else. We have inherent within us happiness, uncaused. So that will let you go. That's what we are. If only we'll get out of the way. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, it's great, guys. I, I think we're we're just about at the end point here. So unless anyone has any other comments, I think we'll we'll close it up. It's been amazing. And um, do you guys have any events or anything you'd like to tell people about uh, by way of? Anything they should check out that's that's coming up, or we always have your websites, and you've got great info on there. And we put Gary's up before, and we'll put Rich's up. If there's anything you want to tell us about? There's a book coming out sometime this year, hmm. book of dialogues that we worked on together. Oh, awesome! Um, and you know, I, I next month we'll see. Yeah, 
Yeah, the, the first uh, 32, 3, 4 dialogues we did uh, were transcribed, and we, uh, Suzanne went and did those for us. And um, we're going to put those into, they're in a book right already, it's already, the Word document's already at the publisher, publisher's looking at it, Lo loves what she's seen so far, so that should come out fairly soon, but it will be a way for people who uh, want to read the dialogues that we did, the first 32 or 34, so whatever it is, uh, in hard in hard copy. I think it may be useful for folks. Oh, it's great. Thank you for, for doing that. I think it'll be a great companion piece to this as well for folks who are in here getting the live uh, discussion. So thank you for that. And yeah, I think that's that's probably it for now. And thank you to everybody who joined us here from around the world live and all of your amazing questions and comments. There's been a lot of great talk in the chat. And uh, I've learned a lot today. And and I hope you guys have too. And, and we'll see you for the next time. We're doing these monthly. The intention is to do it round about first Sunday of the month. So we had the holidays, so we weren't doing it last week. But we're here now, and we'll be back hopefully next month around the same day. We'll confirm that in an email. We'll be sending also a link with the recording download. I'm also going to be putting in the chat now a link to our donation page. This is, as you know, was totally no cost to attend. And we want to keep it that way so that we can open this up and just let people from all around the world uh, either come on live or come on the recording. So if you are in a, in a position that you can contribute, that will help us pay for the tech costs to keep this going and have many more journeys like this one together. So thanks, everybody. And um, I'll be putting that link in the, in the uh, chat right now. So if you'd like to make a donation, we'll also be sending you an email with it. And in a couple of days, you'll have the email to the recording, so you can watch this again. And again, thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, everybody who is on here today with your amazing questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.